Matthew 21, 1, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were coming to Bethphage under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. I go to Mark chapter 11. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Catch up with me when you get there. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. They went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus hath commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out into Bethany with the twelve. Luke chapter 19, verse 29, for the third account of this. Luke chapter 19 Beginning in verse 29, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why ye loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when it was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Then John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19 for the fourth account. Of this, the triumphal entry. John chapter 12, verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he found a young ass, sat thereon as is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him." Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, the reading of your word. Lord, help these words of life and history get down deep into our heart. Help us to understand them, Lord, and would you help me to accurately apply them. And Lord, would you let the Holy Ghost of God have his free will and way in this place. Please use your perfect word to accomplish your perfect work this day. And for everything you do, we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' precious name. 
Amen and amen. All the text passages that we have read just a moment ago apply to the exact same event. We commonly call it the triumphal entry, and it happened on the day that is commonly called, and even now is on your calendar, as Palm Sunday, or today, nearly 2,000 years ago. This was the pinnacle of the treatment of Christ as far as positive treatment goes in his lifetime. And I want to look through this this morning and find out what God would have for us because there's something that is often overlooked, especially towards the end of this ride. Notice, first of all, the fulfillment of a prophecy. In Matthew's gospel, where we began, Matthew 21, 1, the Bible says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage and the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. There are a great many things we read about Christ during his life and 33 and a half years worth of it and the three and a half year ministry of it. The great bulk of the things that we read about him are mundane, not miraculous. We read about him eating. We read about him drinking. We read about him walking. We read about him talking. We read about him riding in boats. We read about him sleeping. But as amazing as it may seem, one thing we do not read about him doing in any and all of those years is riding on the back of an animal. Now he may perhaps have done so, but if he did, none of the gospel writers under the inspiration of God recorded it. Now let me ask you a question. Who, who was Jesus? Good answer. The Son of God. God the Son. The second member of the Trinity. The Messiah. The rightful King of the Jews. Directly descended from David. With that lineage, with that heritage, with the royal blood both of heaven and earth flowing through his veins, it seems like there would never be a day in his life that our precious Lord Jesus was not riding on the back of the finest white horse that this world had to offer. And yet the very first time we find him riding on an animal is as he entered into the very last week of his earthly life. During his earthly life, he had been to Jerusalem year after year after year. He'd gone into the capital city and into the temple as a visitor when it was his own city and his own home that he was visiting while there. But over and over again, he had walked into Jerusalem. He'd done so with little or no fanfare whatsoever. But this was no time for walking. This was no time for entering his city with no fanfare. This was a very special time. It was so special, in fact, that invitation cards had been sent out hundreds of years earlier. Say, preacher, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Zechariah the prophet looked ahead in time and under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God said, He's coming, Israel. Your king is coming. You need to be looking for him. He's going to be riding in a Jerusalem on two different animals, on an ass and on her colt. Now the Jewish people recognized this as an unquestioned prophecy of their Messiah. They knew that for some reason the king would be riding into Jerusalem. When he did, he would do so part of the way on an ass and part of the way upon a colt. Now that must not have made much sense to them. Why not just one or the other? But there was no mistaking the prophecy. It had to be both. Now, I'm always amazed at how God takes care of the minutest details of everything. Look again at what both Mark and Luke record about the cult. Mark 11, 2, And saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him, Luke 19.30, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in which is your entering, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. This was an untrained, wild as a buck little donkey colt. No one had ever sat on his back before. Are you getting the picture? I, I grew up with horses all of my young life. We named them a variety of things. We named the big tall one, Cloudy. Uh, we named the, 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 the Mama Tan. We named her Dixie. We had, a, we had paint we called Bambi. And we had, we, had one, we had one little horse that we called Surprise. Can you maybe guess why we called her Surprise? 
because she was supposed to be nice and tame, and one of us sat down on her back, and surprise! Wasn't so tame after all. You'd be surprised how far one of those things can launch you airborne. So the Lord is telling them, bring me this colt on which no one has ever sat before. And he's just tied up there. He's just a wild animal. But on this day, the Lord had need of him. On this day, it wouldn't just be any old entry into Jerusalem. It would be the triumphal entry. So Jesus has his disciples bring both of them. Three of the gospel accounts emphasize Jesus riding on the colt. In other words, that would be the main animal he rode as he entered into the city. And what that means is that he started the ride on Mama Donkey's back. He allowed the little colt to observe from Mama how things ought to be done when the king of kings has need of you. Mama and Daddy, are you sort of getting the picture there? It is from us, the moms and dads, that our little wild colts are supposed to be getting their cues and their greatest instructions as to how we are to react when the king of kings has need of us. If you expect them just to get it at church, you're going to be sorely disappointed. If you expect them just to get it in Sunday school, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But if your little colts can see from you how to react when the king of kings has need of you, if they get it from mama, if they get it from daddy, if they get it even from older siblings and aunts and uncles, if they take their cues from the older ones in their family life, they will very likely follow in those footsteps and do so rightly. Everything our wild colts need to learn about the Lord, they need to learn from us. So Zechariah made a prophecy hundreds of years ahead of time. Now Jesus was fulfilling that prophecy to the T, letting everyone know the king was riding into their midst. Then there's number two, the fantastic response of the multitude. We'll take this from Matthew chapter 21, verse 6 through 9. Matthew 21, 6 says, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now verse 6 says, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. From the gospel accounts, you know what this means. They went into the village. They found a house. Outside the house, there was a colt and an ass tied up. This is transportation. You understand this? It's not their house. It's not their cars. They go to this house. There's a colt. There's a donkey tied up. They just simply untie them and begin to walk away. Grand theft donkey. <laughs> At least that's what some folks thought. Probably what any of us would have thought. And so as Jesus told them what happened, so he said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you you doing there? And they said, the Lord has need of them. Now, if you want to see how likely that is to work, if it's not the Lord, just pick some random neighborhood somewhere, look around in people's cars, and you'll eventually come to one that has the keys sitting there in the the unlocked car because people aren't very careful. And just, un- just, just, just undo their door and just sit down inside their car and, and stick their key in there and turn, turn the car on. I promise you, you will, get as, you will get attention as quickly as if you went into Lowe's and fired up a chainsaw. I'm just promising you, people are going to give you their attention if you go into their driveway and, and you turn on their car. And when they run out to you and ask you what you're doing, just say, the Lord had need of it. <laughs> yeah, you're going to jail. Okay, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to jail. And yet, these guys walk in, and, and they take the colt, they take the donkey, and come out, hey, well, what are you doing? They say, the Lord has need of, of them, and that's all that was needed. These folks didn't have to ask any questions. They didn't need any explanations. Just the fact that the Lord needed them was enough for them. Don't you long for the day when that's actually enough for everybody? And I don't mean everybody out in the world. I mean everybody that even calls themselves a Christian. I long for the day when every simple request from the Lord is regarded as a command to our spirit and is willfully and joyfully obeyed without question, without hesitation. You you, you expect me to be faithful, Lord? Yes, sir. You expect me to be modest, Lord? Yes, sir. You expect me to win souls, Lord? Yes, sir. You expect me to support missions, Lord? Yes, sir. You expect me to have clean speech, Lord? Yes, sir. You expect me to be pure, Lord? Yes, sir. I long for the day when every Every simple request from him is regarded as a command to be obeyed, and we do so joyfully. Well, the disciples got the animals. They brought them back to Jesus. Then they took their own clothes, which, by the way, were expensive and hard to come by in those days. They're made by hand, each and every piece. They're expensive and hard to come by. They they put their own clothes on those animals so that Jesus could ride 
those animals comfortably. You know what you'll find if you study the gospel accounts? There were some people that were very good to Jesus sporadically along the way. But do you realize that the last time you find anybody specifically tending to the comfort of Jesus was when his mother took swaddling cloths and wrapped him in it? It's the last time the Bible talks about anybody tending to his comfort. But now, 33 and a half years later, this is a special day. This is when the king is going to ride into Jerusalem. And so the disciples take their own clothing and put them on the backs of these animals just to make the king comfortable as he rides. But that was the disciples. You sort of expect that from the disciples. But what came next probably surprised even the disciples themselves. Matthew 21, 8 says, And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. As Jesus was riding toward the city, the multitude started to gather all around. They saw the bare arms of the disciples who laid their own garments in the way. And, and somebody from the crowd took off his garment. He learned from, from what he saw from God's people. That's exactly the way it's supposed to be happening and he, he saw their example he takes his crowd off and lays it in front of the donkey so that even the king's donkey could move forward in comfort and then someone else and then someone else and then someone else this little colt carrying the Lord was walking on a carpet of clothing as he carried the king some others decided to add their part as well they cut down branches from the trees and placed them on the roadway ahead of the little colt uh, John adds this John 12, 12 and 13 on the next day much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Jesus was sitting on comfortable clothes as he rode that colt. The colt was walking on a carpet of clothing and palm branches. Others took palm branches and went to meet him with them. You see, when royalty was passing by, people would wave palm branches in the air as greeting and he would sit there and feel that cool air as he rode by. So people are waving palm branches both to glorify and to comfort him as he passes. And by the way, this was not a quiet and dignified moment either. Look at Matthew chapter 21 verse 9 because they had something to say while all of this was happening. Matthew 21 9, And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That word Hosanna is a great word. Shout with me please. Hosanna again. Hosanna again. Hosanna again. Again! Again! That word meant save us. Save us now. When they called him the son of David, they were therefore rightly acknowledging him as the Messiah, their rightful king, when you combine it with this word Hosanna. All this, everything that came out of their mouth was praise and glory to the one that they believed had the right to sit on the throne. The bigwigs didn't believe that. They called him one born of fornication. The upper crust didn't believe that. They accused him of having a devil. The elite did not believe that. They called him a drunkard and a glutton. But on this day, their opinions did not matter even a little bit. Thousands upon thousands turned out to shout his praises and give him the glory that he deserved the entire time he'd been there walking among them. So often in his life in ministry, the multitude had gotten it wrong. On this day, maybe not in all the details of what they were expecting, but certainly in how they treated him, they finally got it right. Did you realize it's impossible to think too highly of him? It's impossible to praise him so gloriously that he has to say, whoa, 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 hey, hey, you're going a little bit overboard there. I'm not really worthy of all that. You can't do it. He's worthy of all of it and infinitely more. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Ancient of days, the wonderful, the counselor, the almighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Praise him. He's worthy. Notice then, number three, the frustrated complaint of the Pharisees. Verse 39, I just love this. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. May I point out four words in this verse that paint a very enjoyable picture? They're the words, from among the multitude. Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. In other words, get the picture. Where's Jesus right then? He's on a donkey. He's, he's sitting up high, right? There's a multitude, <laughs> crowd of people. I mean, it is shoulder to shoulder. There are Pharisees there, used to being the center of attention. There are Pharisees there, and all of a sudden today they're, they're squished in like this, shoulder to shoulder. And all around them, people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
and Pharisees from among the multitude. Doing this. You can't say that. And they look up at Jesus. They, they look up. Don't you love that? They look up at Jesus. Master, Master, make them stop. Don't you hear what they're saying? Make them stop. Jesus has such composure. He's riding above them. And they're whining and complaining and mully grubbing. Don't you know just once in his life, he really wanted to give him a raspberry? <laughs> and yet he doesn't. He simply says, I'm telling you that if these were not crying out, the stones would cry out. There's no reason to take that any way but literally. On this day, if man didn't get it right, creation itself was going to. Aren't you glad for once that our kind finally got it right? Aren't you glad humanity finally didn't do something stupid just once? Once. We finally got it right. All oh, this is epic. All oh, this is amazing. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. It's the triumphal entry. But the problem is, most preaching and teaching about it stops there at the peak. But the ride's not over yet. And as much as I'm enjoying the ride, as much as I'm enjoying seeing Christ glorified, the ride's not over yet. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 41, at the forlorn cry of Jesus. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench round about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. I really want you to get this. The ride's still happening. He's still comfortably seated on the clothing of others on the back of that animal. The animal's still riding on a carpet of clothing and palm branches. People are still waving palm fronds in the air. The shouting is still going on. Hosanna! 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 But look at his face. Look at his face. What do you see on his face? There's tears streaming down his face. While everybody's shouting his praises, he's sobbing like a baby. It wasn't like this in the early part of the ride. He didn't start crying until he got near the city. In other words, the earlier part of the ride was very enjoyable, and he soaked it all in. People did right, and he genuinely appreciated it. And while it was the greatest thing that ever happened to him while he was here, as he got nearer to the city, he was so brokenhearted that he wept, saying in verse 42, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this, thy day, this particular day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from thine eyes. There's a play on words here you may not be aware of. Jerusalem means the city of peace. Jesus is saying, if you'd only known the real peace that you could have access to. You say, but preacher, they were getting it right. They were shouting his praises. They were glorifying him. Look at me. A week later, a week later, a week later, that same crowd was shouting again. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him! Listen to me. As much as we ought to be praising and glorifying God, as much as I am in favor and as much as I love shouting, waving our hands, shedding tears over his praises, as much as all that's appropriate, if it stops there, it's nothing more than a pep rally. If that does not translate into a life of dedication lived for the Lord, then the moment was just a moment. God wants more than just a moment from me. He wants more than just a moment from you. If you're lost, He wants you to repent of your sins, turn over management of your life, receive Him of your Savior, and get born again. If you're saved, he wants you, according to Romans 12, 1 and 2, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not transformed to this, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. He's not just interested in us shouting a few praises in here. He's interested in us living for God all day, every day, out there. You can praise Him, and I encourage you to do so. Please praise Him. He's worthy. But if it stops there, a moment's just a moment. Don't let it be just a moment. 
give him your all, not just your outward words.